Well, good morning, everybody. Um, thanks for your attendance. Rob Milne is my name. I'm um, chairman of, of Brickworks. Um, with me this morning, I have Lindsay Partridge, our MD, Grant uh, Davis, who I think you've all met before. He's our financial man. And the guy on the left, I don't know, my left, you probably haven't seen before, Mark Eleanor. He's our now general manager of building products for Australia and, um, and America. And he will give a, a presentation as well today. So an excellent result. So on that note, I, I won't steal their thunder. I'll hand over to Lindsay. Thank you, Chairman. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to spend some time with us today. I'll start by uh, providing a, an overview to you about our commitment to sustainability and responsible business. And I know um, this has become an increasing important issue for our investors, and we're frequently uh, reminded of that. Then I'd like to discuss our history of asset growth and shareholder returns, and I'll cover the uh, property performance for the first half. Then I'll hand to Mark Eleanor, who will handle the building products for Australia and the United States. And then finally, Grant Douglas will handle the, uh, the financial numbers. So just looking at this responsible business practices, um, we understand we've got to take a long-term view um, to achieve a lot of the, the issues that are currently confronting us. And uh, we've already made significant progress in a number of areas. Uh, in our core, our, sustainability, our, our commitment is to sustainability. And I feel very good in this area because I feel there's no more sustainable product than clay bricks. If there is one, please tell me what it is. Um, no one has been up to that to date. Um, there are a number of key areas that we look at, and a lot of that is also in regards to the health and safety of our employees, uh, the diversity of our workforce, where we're very pleased to announce that we now have 31% of our senior executives are females, and 23% of the total workforce is females. And um, over a long period of time, we've made significant progress in reducing our carbon emissions. We didn't just start now or set some target. Since 2006, we have already reduced our carbon emissions by some 42%. And as far as the community is concerned, we've had a very long association and greater than 20 years. We have, we have, we have supported the Children's Cancer Institute and we've made donations, both the company and the employees of the company have made donations exceeding $4.4 million. Firstly, turning to safety, once again, we made significant improvement in this area. We had a record uh, total recordable injury rate uh, per million hours of 10.3, and that was down from 11.7 in the prior year. So that was 9.8 in Australia and 10.9 in North America. But what I think we're particularly proud of, if you look at the two graphs there, you see that we started a long way behind the eight ball in the United States in the space of five years. We've managed to bring that down to it equals the performance we're achieving in Australia. So we're very happy um, to what's been achieved with Mark and uh, his American team. We had three lost time injuries during the period. That was one in Australia and two in North America. Now looking at the environmental performance and sustainability of our products, bricks have a lot of things that are going for them. We guarantee our bricks 100 for 100 years, and we have many buildings out there that are already 100 years old. And when those buildings come to the end of their life, they'll be able to be recycled or reused. And that's unlike many of our uh, competitors' products. We have some other critical performance characteristics uh, besides that long life cycle. Um, they're very efficient and very sustainable. Um, a lot of the bricks we make, um, you know, the clay is very abundant raw material. But a lot of the bricks we make, particularly here in the city, actually come from recycled material, whether the government's building a tunnel or digging a hole to put some waste, or in fact, uh, digging a hole to put a building. A lot of that material ends up in our clay pits and we subsequently make the bricks out of it. So an enormous percentage, particularly in Sydney, is made from recycled material. Uh, we have, our products have thermal mass, and, which is quite different to lightweight materials, reduces the need, need for artificial heating and cooling. They're low maintenance, fire resistance, and do not emit any toxic or volatile compounds. And of course, they are fireproof. And there was an article yesterday where of all the buildings in, Australia, in, uh, in New South Wales, which I think is close to 600, that need the cladding, the combustible cladding replaced, there's only two being done to date. Um, now, a lot of those buildings, are going, they're going to uh, actually move away from aluminium altogether, they don't feel confident with that. And I think we're gonna see 
failed a number of these buildings either reclad in brick or reclad in thin brick or reclad in some other ceramic material that's not combustible. Uh, we also uh, have, over a long period of time, produced the bricks from, from bioenergy. Uh, in a lot of cases, that's actually mostly down at uh, Tasmania where we use sawdust, but we're also using other waste carbonaceous materials in our, uh, our products, which is further reducing our emissions. And we have two plants that are running on landfill gas. Um, we also have an arrangement with DeLorean where we're looking at producing bioenergy from waste food. Uh, and that is really a very exciting uh, prospect because I don't think any of us uh, think it's really very ethical that we waste food and this is a very good use for it. As far as our property is concerned, um, all of our latest developments at uh, Oakdale West are of sustainable, sustainable design and they're including uh, drought resistant landscaping, rainwater harvesting, electric vehicle charging, LED lighting and recycling facilities. And currently we have enough solar power stored out there for 11.6 megawatts, which is equivalent to taking about 7,500 cars off the road. Now looking at the asset growth and shareholder returns, uh, we've aimed to do this by having sustained asset growth and a steady increasing dividend. Um, by, keep, uh, by achieving these, we've been, out, been able to outperform uh, the other, other, many other companies on the share market over the longer term. So over the last 20 years, um, there was only one year when we didn't increase the net asset backing of the company. And so during that period of time, the share price, the net tangible assets, the share price has grown from $4.13 to $19.79, almost $20. Uh, so that's 8% 8, 8 compound per annum over that period of time. Uh, now that net tangible asset doesn't recognise the full market value of our assets. So for example, property that's held outside the property trust is held at the original acquisition price and the value of our investments are because they're equity counted rather than taking the market price. Whereas the book value is below what the market price is. So uh, investment in Washington H. Salt Patterson and Fastbrick have a market value of over $2.7 billion. Our interest in the two property trusts has a combined net asset value of $2.2 billion. And the building products net tangible asset in Australia and North America, $577 million. And there's three parcels of land we've identified that have a as is, where is market value of $461 million. We have net debt of $595 million, giving us an inferred current asset backing of $5.4 billion, or approximately $35 a share. So when we look at the last five years, there's been significant increase in our asset value over that, over, over that period of time. And that's come from us expanding internationally in our building products business, where we've become the largest brickmaker in the northeast and midwest regions of the United States. We've completed a number of significant upgrades across our plants and consolidated our operations. In Australia, we've had a major capex program. We've invested close on $300 million and built and now commissioned uh, the most advanced masonry plant in Australia. And as I speak today, we're in the process of commissioning uh, the most advanced brick plant in the world. We've removed ourselves from some areas where we were, were not getting adequate returns, and that includes Oswest Timber and Aus, Aus, Austral Precast, that, which has allowed us to focus more on more attractive opportunities. Just moving on to dividends, we're proud of our history of dividends and over some 46 years, we've either, 47 years, either sustained or increased our dividends. Uh, quite impressive when you compare that to most other building product companies in Australia. Uh, I don't think we have any equal in that regard. Uh, in, in this year, uh, dividends were increased, or this half the dividends were increased one cent or, or by 5% uh, to 23 cents. Uh, that will be, uh, the record date for that will be the 11th of April and paid on the 2nd of May. Looking at the shareholder returns, it's quite an impressive graph. Um, I know it is exceeded by, by Sol Patterson's even more impressive graph. A 10% uh, compound for 20 years. 
Uh, so very impressive, but it exceeds the All Ords Accumulation Index over 3, 5, 10, 15 and 20 years. So $1,000 invested in 2003 would be worth $7,000 at the end of the period. Now turning to the highlights for the period, it was a very strong performance once again, a record first half profit of $410 million, up 24% on the prior period. The Property Trust was one of the standout parts of that with a return of $484 million and the value of our shareholding in Washington Take Salt Patterson also increased by $285 million. As I mentioned, we've completed major capital investments both in Australia and North America. The, 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 our size of our asset base has doubled in five years. Looking at some of the key numbers in there, the EBITDA from the, from the operations was $607 million, up 25%. The profit from the, uh, the underlying profit after tax was up 24% to $410 million. And the, that translates into 269 cents per share. Including the, the impact of significant items, uh, the, under, the, the headline was down 38% to $354 million. Part of that was because in the prior year um, we had the very large one off of, of the Milton transaction with Soles. Now looking at the divisional review, there are four parts to Brickworks, as I'm sure most of you are aware. The property, investments, building products, Australia, building products, North America. Uh, just in case some of you are not aware, the, the, we talk about the property trust. In actual fact, there's a whole, uh, many, many property trusts, but they basically fall into two categories. So they're 50-50 joint venture with Goodman and the Brickworks Manufacturing Trust, where we own 50.1. The only difference between them really is the fact is the latter, uh, we're the tenant. But moving forward, that won't remain the case because there are properties within those trusts which can be developed and they'll be most probably developed and leased to external parties. Uh, outside of that, we have approximately another 5,000 acres of land. Most of that is in regional areas. So it was another outstanding period with an EBIT of $453 million. Uh, the highlight was that we moved the Oakdale East Stage 2 into the JV Trust for $301 million. That delivered a profit of $263 million. A development in the, in the Trust um, continued with a number of uh, facilities uh, completing during the period, and that delivered a development profit of $54 million. That wasn't the only uh, profit from those, those assets because under a change in the accounting standards, we had where the building has passed 80% we do take up approximately 80% of the profit in advance. So the overall profit of that um, large number of buildings we had was uh, significantly more than that. But a major highlight for us, we've now exceeded 1 million metres of square metres of leased area within the trust. Total rental income continues to grow and was up 47% to $25 million, and that includes the $5 million contribution from the Manufacturing Trust. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about it in a moment about the, the rental income because some of those properties just came in during the period. You haven't seen a full year, full year's rent on them. And of course, some of them have uh, lease uh, you know, free periods um, and that all takes a while for it all to kick in. So the total value of leased assets held across the property trust was almost $5 billion at the end of the period. The trust also holds a further $772 million worth of land, which is currently under development. Most of that, of course, is in the Oakdale East. We just moved in, and some of it uh, that's remaining in Oakdale West. After including borrowings of $1.2 billion, total net asset value was almost $4.5 billion, and our half share of that um, is at $2.2 billion, as I mentioned. More importantly, uh, when we put Oakdale East in, there was the potential for us to take uh, cash out that period of time, but it was decided to leave the those funds within the trust, avoiding us to take out any construction finance when we build out that property. But the outcome of that was that the gearing in the trust has now fallen again, down to I think a very low 21%. Uh, there's a photo of the, the Oakdale East. Um, the stage one is the area on the right in blue. You can see our masonry factory and an office and warehouse we have there ourselves and you know, three other tenants. And to the left of that photo, you can see 
Plant 3, which is in the process of being decommissioned as we speak, and the pit area behind it, which is in the process of being rehabilitated. And right at the top of the screen, just in front of the reservoir, you can see Plant 2, where we're building uh, this new state-of-the-art facility. Now, we always get asked every period, what does the, what's the future outlook for the trust? Um, and it's ongoing, it's, 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 a, it's a living um, operation. There's always something happening, either finishing a, a job or commencing a new pre-lease. Um, so we look at, uh, that sort of graph tries to show in a waterfall chart where it's all going. The current annualised rent is $178 million. Um, and that exceeds the run rate because of what I said before, because of the delay in the, in the, in the rent coming through and getting a full year rent. When all those facilities in Oakdale West come through, there'll be a combined $32 million rent coming from them. So greater than the future years, so if we complete the balance of Oakdale West, that will deliver an additional 20 to $25 million a year uh, rent, gross rent this is, and, a, and an additional $0.5 billion in assets. And when we build out and develop Oakdale East, it will deliver approximately 40 to $45 million a year in rent and about $1 billion in assets. Uh, now, in addition to that, and one other area which I get lots of questions about is, um, well, it's always about cap rates, but uh, rents have increased quite dramatically. Now, not all of it, some of our rents are on in inflation-based increases, but others are on fixed rates. Um, and as those leases roll over and they've got to come to market, well then they've got to come and meet the market rate. So um, within the trust, currently we believe that the overall uh, rent is about 20 to 25% below the, the current market rate. To give you some idea how much the market rate has increased. So potentially there's an uplift of about 35 to $40 million uh, coming through as they are released. So when we, if we were to complete those Oakdale East and Oakdale West, as I mentioned, we give us a, and, and top of the other properties, give us a total rent increasing to more than $275 million a year. That's gross. And the assets exceeding $6.4 billion. On top of that, we have a number of parcels of land, as I mentioned, inside the Manufacturing Trust. Uh, one at Yatla, for example, where there's potential to do uh, future development and we'll work our way through those steadily. And as I mentioned before, there's three identified properties uh, outside the trust, which we think we have great potential to bring into the trust. And they are the Craigieburn site in Victoria, the Horsley Park site in New South Wales here, and the Mid-Atlantic site in Pennsylvania. I'll quickly look at investments, because I know most of you are staying here for the Washington H. Salt Patterson presentation a bit later on. Um, our main investment, of course, is a 26% shareholding in WHSP. Uh, during the period, they delivered an underlying contribution of $100 million, which was up 37%. And they delivered a cash dividend of $55 million, which was up uh, 61%. And the combined market value of those investments is $2.732 billion. I might just jump over to the next slide, because I know um, Todd will be talking to that soon. And so I'll now hand over to Mark, who will run you through the building products. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, in Australia, building commencements declined significantly in the first half of the 2023 financial year in response to rising interest rates and a reducing pipeline of work from the Home Builder Program. Nationally, detached houses commencements were down 18%, with relatively consistent declines across all states. Although commencements have now declined significantly from the recent peak, there remains a healthy pipeline of projects under construction. During the upturn, building timelines extended as a result of supply chain delays and labour constraints. As a result, the usage of brick and roof tiles on site is now typically lagging commencements by six months or more. Looking across the states, residential housing activity has been weakest in Western Australia, with detached house and multi-residential commencements down 30% and 34% respectively. The major East Coast states have typically seen declines in the range of 10 to 20%. Next slide, thanks, Mark. Despite the reduced commencement, sales remain resilient with revenue for the half up 11% to $364 million. Increases in austral bricks and concrete products were partially offset by a decline in Bristol roofing. 
EBIT was $25 million for the period and EBITDA was $50 million, down 6%. The decrease in earnings were primarily due to the decline in Bristol Roofing and Austrobrex Western Australia. Most other businesses' units recorded improved earnings. The launch of the Brickworks Manufacturing Trust resulted in a negative $2 million impact to EBIT compared to the prior period. Looking more closely at a business unit profit, within Austral Bricks, revenue and earnings increased. Higher earnings in New South Wales and Victoria were partially offset by a decline in Western Australia and South Australia. As Lindsay mentioned, construction of the new brick plant in Horsley Park in Sydney will be completed in the coming months and hopefully the kiln will be lit mid-April. Sales volume in Western Australia was sharply lower as a result of the slowdown in building activity and the loss of key accounts in that market following attempted repeated increases to increased margins. As a result, production was reduced to just one plant at Cardup, with the Bellevue facility closed in November. A detailed review of future options in the state is underway, including a potential business sale or exit. Advanced Cladding Systems, a new business system unit within Austral Bricks, was launched during the period. This business will focus on commercialising thin brick cladding systems, a product category that is experiencing growing demand, particularly in the high-rise commercial and multi-residential segments, and uh, we do sell a lot of thin brick and wall systems in the United States. Concrete product earnings significantly increased compared to prior corresponding periods, with Austral Masonry and Southern Cross Cement both delivering improved results. Within Austral Masonry, commissioning of the Oakdale East plant in Sydney was completed during the period. Performance of the plant has been pleasing, with product cycle times and plant efficiently progressively improving during the half. The reduced earnings within Bristol Roofing were primarily attributable to lower sales volume in Victoria and New South Wales. Across the country, trade shortages remain a significant issue for both tile and metal roofs installations and can continue to impact the ability to meet market demand. Sales of premium imported terracotta tiles were lower, with high shipping rates and extreme energy prices in Europe adversely impacting unit results. These supply chain issues are now easing. Um, just switching to North America, where activity has been mixed during the period, varying significantly by region and segment. Across the country, the total value of the building activity commenced was up 18% compared to prior period. A 55% increase in non-residential and a 9% increase in the multi-residential was offset by a 25% reduction in single-family commencements. As the graph there highlights, our key regional exposure is in the Midwest, uh, is in the Midwest and the Northeast. Combined, these two regions will make up around 80% of our total sales revenue. Building activity in these regions was relatively consistent with the rest of the country, with increased activity in non-residential building offset by weakness in the single-family market. Sales revenue uh, was up 18% to $220 million for the half. The uplift in revenue is driven primarily by strong growth in sales to the multi-family residential segment and through the vertically integrated retail division that we've renamed and rebranded Brickwork Supply. Retail sales were further supported by a small acquisition of Washington DC Brick Distributor Capital Brick in February of 2022. EBITDA was up 16% to, to 14 million. The prior corresponding period included a small benefit in relation to property sales. Including this, EBITDA was up by 24%. Margins continue to be impacted by labour constraints similar to here in Australia, resulting in higher wages to attract and retain staff. In addition, other cost pressures are persisting across the supply chain, including a significant increase in transportation and mining costs. A larger proportion of sales to the residential segment uh, was pleasing in Texas. Particularly, these base ranges are at lower prices and had an adverse impact on our margin. Despite these challenges, the business continues to make progress on key strategic priorities. Over the past five years, we've undertaken a plant rationalisation program that's seen the number of brick operating plants reduced from 16 to eight. The program continued during the half of the closure of our 1955 kiln in Caledonia, in Ohio, with the output transferred uh, to plants in Pittsburgh and also to Iberia in Ohio. Extensive upgrades are now complete at Sergeant Bluff and our Dell plant the second kiln is coming online over the next couple of months in Iowa. In addition, production of our handmade and thin bricks were consolidated from our old York factory to our mid-Atlantic site and Pittsburgh plants respectively, both in Pennsylvania. The picture on the screen is the college at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee. 
Um, it looks like a picture from the past, but that was only just completed, and we supplied 800,000 bricks from our Mid-Atlantic plant, um, which is a terrific job. And these are the scale of the universities and the schools that we get across America. Unlike Australia, most schools are 1.2 to 1.4 uh, million premium bricks. Following numerous acquisitions, the store networks now comprise of 25 locations. During the period, all stores have been unified under one brand, Brickwork Supply, with locations, market strategy and product range being fully aligned. In October, we executed a supply agreement with Brickability for the sale of bricks into the UK market. The 10-year supply agreement includes a minimum purchase of 10 million bricks per year, and we've been supplied out of a factory we're recommissioning at, at, uh, at Rocky, a place called Rocky Ridge, which is up near Camp David in Maryland. And we'll transport those bricks out of the port of Baltimore, and hopefully they'll be headed uh, across early in the new year. The UK market is a very um, um, brick intensive market with about 2 billion bricks per year produced and about a billion bricks per year imported. And with that, I'll hand over to Grant for the financials. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. As Lindsay mentioned, total underlying group EBITDA for the half was $607 million, up 25%. After depreciation and amortization, the underlying group EBIT was up 26% to $569 million. Total borrowing costs were $23 million and tax was $136 million. This resulted in an underlying net profit after tax from continuing operations of $410 million, up 24%. Significant items decreased net profit after tax by $48 million, and I'll discuss that uh, a bit more in detail in a moment. Uh, in addition, discontinued operations contributed an after-tax loss of $7 million for the period, uh, mainly related to non-cash impairment of assets and closure costs within the Austral precast business. This resulted in statutory net profit after-tax of $354 million for the half. Uh, turning to significant items, uh, the table on the screen shows our significant items in more detail. Uh, obviously, the largest of those is in relation to uh, our, the non-cash impairment of Austral Bricks Western Australia for $32 million post-tax. Uh, this follows our impairment testing process uh, as part of the half and primarily comprises impairments to plant and equipment and right-of-use assets. Uh, the impairment is based on our reassessment of the outlook for the business, which deteriorated significantly over the past six months, as alluded to by Mark earlier. Uh, we also had uh, plant relocation and commissioning costs of $8 million, um, mainly related to the commissioning of both the Oakdale East uh, Masonry plant, so the value added side of that plant, and the Horsley Brick uh, plant at uh, the new plant two at Horsley Park. Uh, we also had uh, $3 million in restructuring and site closure costs, uh, mainly in relation to the closure of Bellevue um, late in the last calendar year. Uh, we also have the standard um, share of significant items for our holdings in uh, Sols and FBR. Turning to cash flow, um, total operating cash flow for the half was uh, $46 million, down from $63 million in the prior corresponding period. Cash generation was adversely impacted by inventory build within building products operations, um, the plant commissioning costs I talked about earlier, and uh, higher interest costs in the period. CapEx of $56 million was incurred, uh, mainly related to the construction of the new brick plant in Western Sydney. Um, that major capital program has been going on over the past uh, few years, is now nearing its completion. And dividend payments of $62 million were pay made for the half. On to key financial indicators. As Lindsay mentioned, net tangible assets per share was up 8% over the period to $19.79 a share. Uh, shareholders' equity increased by $271 million to over $3.5 billion, which represents $23.19 a share. Underlying return on shareholders' equity was 23% on an annualized basis, in line with financial year 2022. Net debt increased to $595 million, up by $102 million over the period. Taking into account increased equity, uh, gearing was only up marginally to 17%. Interest cover is very conservative at 23 times. Uh, we currently have around $340 million in funding headroom based on committed debt facilities and significant headroom within our existing bank covenants. I'll now hand back to Lindsay to discuss the outlook. Thanks. 
Mark and Grant. It's the right page. Well, I think uh, you know really importantly that um, within our property trust, all all of our warehouses are fully rendered. Uh, we have a development pipeline and we have strong demand. We expect significant increases in rental income over the coming years, as I explained to you. I've also mentioned that we have a number of properties which we believe that we can move into the trust, including the Mid-Atlantic site in Pennsylvania, Craigieburn site in Victoria. Across the building products, uh, we're confident sales will remain fairly strong during the second half. However, there's, there's no doubt that in the seven, second half of the calendar year, there will be a slowdown. Uh, interesting though, however, um, when you look at the tightness of the rental vacancy market, I don't know if any of you sort of drive around the city in the weekend, but you'll see lines of people 50 and 100 metres long trying to get an apartment. And most single bedroom apartments have gone up about three or $400 a week to about $1,000 a week. So that is running counter um, to uh, the interest rates. And so there's going to be some friction at that point. If, you, if you're wondering where the demand came from, there was a very slight change in the occupation rate during the pandemic. Prior to the pandemic, the occupation rate in Australia was about 2.59 people in Australia, and it fell to 2.50. That 0.09 difference is 160,000 dwellings. On top of that, in the last 12 months, we've had 250,000 people return to Australia who need another 100,000 dwellings. So in the space of about 12 months, we're a quarter of a million dwellings short in Australia. So I can't see that the the, um, the the housing starts going to stay down long. I, I think once the interest rates stabilise, we're going to see strong return to demand. Um, and that's exactly what we've seen in the US where the main uh, interest rate is the 30-year mortgage rate. It's now been stable for four or five months. And we've said pick up and demand, we're seeing a stabilisation and the drop off there. So that's in residential. But for us, of course, in North America, you know, we're very much focused on commercial. And when I say commercial, I'm not talking about office building type commercial, which is most probably the one area that we're all, all glad we're not in. But um, but I'm talking about commercial as in, in multi-res buildings is our main area where we go in. But also, as Mark mentioned, universities, schools, uh, fast food chains, uh, various sporting stadiums and whatever. Uh, that's the sort of work that, that, that we talk about when we're in commercial. And we see no data up on that. The architects uh, are very, the billing index that they have over there is very strong. And we're seeing the same situation here in Australia. Commercial work in Australia and the United States uh, is strong and we've seen no let up in that area at all. And of course, we're very confident of Washington Hayshall Patterson's future prospects. Um, and, you know, I think therefore we're going to see significant growth in our assets over the longer term and a continuation of our ability to increase dividends. So, I guess, Chairman, we take uh, go to questions, if there's any questions. So, how are we handling the questions from online? We'll go, we've got one right here, so take you straight up. Yeah. Just wait, there's a mic coming your way. Um, thank you, Lee Power, UBS. I'm not sure, Lindsay or Mark, whether um, who wants to answer this, but um, just a comment around um, kind of continued cost pressures. Can you give us an idea of what brick pricing you have in the market in Australia at the moment? And then going on like thinking on a longer term basis so once the pipeline is exhausted um, we're obviously in a kind of a higher cost environment how do you think those two match as volumes come off and input costs potentially say higher how do you think pricing plays out in that environment yeah. well in, first of all in relation to historic you saw that we basically uh, increased 11 percent our turnover which was mainly um, just the volume was constrained by all the bottlenecks. So that was mainly our price rise and it just wasn't quite enough. So that tells you what the inflation was in the last last 12 months. The areas where we saw in that period is clearly wages. I was talking earlier today that you know, we we're paying most like electricians and fitters around the $30 an hour. Now the only ones we can get a contract is at $90 an hour, right? And in a lot of, we've got plants, a couple of plants in Australia, a couple of plants in America, where even at $90 an hour, we can't get tradespeople to maintain the plants. Um, so that, that is a real problem. So the non-performance the non of those plants not running is, is a cost as well. Um, we had thought that the areas that were a problem last year, like glazes, stains, oxides, had steadied up a little bit, and that's generally the case. But this year, in the last six months, we've seen another wave. I think some of the material companies were a bit slow in responding. I don't want to mention any names here, well-known names, but a bit slow in responding to the 
increase in costs coming through. We've seen a, a dramatic lift in the last six months in aggregate sands, cement, which is a, you know, even supplying itself, cement's gone up. So we're seeing those, those sort of products come through with increases. Um, the other one which has hit us here in Australia, you know, this year, this, point, uh, this uh, calendar year, electricity, a neat 100%, not 10% or 20%, 100%. Um, so these are big increases to uh, take. So we've kept our foot on the price rise pedal and we're putting through another high single digit price rise. It varies in timing and magnitude depending on the business and the state. Uh, but we have no we have no choice. We have to push that through. Uh, it's if the people have to pay the price, or that's, we don't supply. It's just as easy as that. There, there can't be any other way about it because, as you've seen, the minute we don't get adequate returns, the auditors are going to come up with a red text and put it through our books. So you have to get the return. You just have to put the prices up. We've got no choice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then um, Craigie Burn, can you just give us an idea of how we should be thinking about that in terms of timing? Megan's right behind you there, but we've been at it now, what, 15 years? Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> but we were trying to get it into resi and, um, you know, they just, the government just felt it wasn't big enough, you know, to, to, be, to stand on its own as a suburb. And they, in Victoria, they tend to sort of release suburbs. Um, so then we've sort of come across to commercial. We're working with Goodman through the issues there. Um, I don't know, do you want to add anything to that, Megan? Do, no. <laughs> we're working on it, okay? Yeah. But I mean, it's getting surrounded. I mean, we're, it, it's, it's days got to come. I mean, you know, it's like all these things. We managed to sort of get the timing sort of right in the end. But I think hopefully we've got better prospects on the Mid Atlantic site in the next 12 months and maybe Craigie Burns, you know, a year or two after that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, right in the second <laughs> row here. Thanks, Matty. The second row. Yeah. Well done again, Lindsay. Thank um, you. Um, just on those two properties, Craigie Burn and Mid Atlantic, what what are they worth? <laughs> well, we said in there that there's a combined value of four hundred and four hundred and sixty million. That those three properties, as is where is. Yeah. Four sixty million. Four hundred sixty million. Yeah, yeah that includes Horsley Park. Yeah. Right. Um, in terms of the new kiln that's going to be here in Sydney, how much is that going to add to efficiency? Look, uh, good, good. Good point. Um, there was two kilns. The one kilns replacing two kilns, so that's a good start, right? But one of the kilns was our very best kiln, and was originally put in to run at about. Um, I was talking cars per day. I think most of you've been a bit worse. Cars per day. So it was put in to run thirty-six cars for most of its life. We ran at forty-four. Then in the last five or ten years, we made the brick slider. We did a few other things, and we got up to sixty cars a day. So its fuel consumption was it was just incredible because it was running so fast. Because the losses through the walls are fixed, so the more you can put through the tunnel. Well, but it, this kiln is going to be pretty pretty quick. Um, but it might take us a year or two before we catch up that other kiln. But what we are doing more is putting in more, particularly in um, Queensland, we're using like uh, sawdust flour, wood flour. It comes out of say like a door plant, so it's waste material and we've, we call that onboard fuel. So we're starting to get some, some amazingly low fuel consumptions out of, these, out of these kilns. And in relation to your investment in FBR, what's your intention there? You've got 19.9 .9 now. What, I can't what... tell you. <laughs> Good try. <laughs> and, and just getting back to Western Australia, um, the Buckridge thing has never been sold. So presumably, uh, are you saying that market's basically a write-off in, in the next five years? Well, look, it's hard for us to see a way forward. Um, you know, we didn't agree with the ACCC approving them to purchase Midland, which gave them 80% market share. Um, so to compete against a company with that level of market share in a vertically integrated, because you can't contest their own companies, um, you know, it's a very difficult place to be in. And we have really got to the point now we're almost sub-scale. Sub but having said that, um, their own performance, uh, you know, they've lost a lot of money in the last three or four years. They're running negative cash. They've stopped taking orders for new houses. They've got 3,000 houses to build, most of which they've got to build at a loss. So I would think that they're in a, I think that whole market is in a very tough place at the moment. Okay, um, how are we handling questions online? Are you gonna read them out or just, oh no, we've got one more here, Sorry. 
Thanks, Lindsay. Um, just a quick question around volume and um, scenario planning and how you'd uh, essentially adjust the, um, the production profile of the business should you have a decline to manage operating leverage, Lindsay, perhaps in Australia as well as in, in the US, if you could just give us your sense of how you're planning for the next well, six to 12 months. At the moment, um, believe it or not, our brick sales this month exceed where they were a year ago. I think that you think about that because the bottlenecks are coming out of the system, so the run rate of the builders is going quicker. So that's the first thing. So we haven't seen any downturn as, as yet. Um, that's the first point. The second thing, we're about to swap our biggest plant, right, which is now going offline as we talk. My biggest concern is not um, reducing production. My biggest concern today is that I don't run out over the next sort of three months as I get the new plant up, because the new plant is likely to take three to six months to really get rolling. Um, so we're watching that. And when we've taken off such a big capacity um, to just, we're going to demolish that plant so we can develop uh, Oakdale East. Uh, so there's a bit, of, that's our main concern at the moment. So I'm not worried about stock at this point in time. Um, but we're also very lucky, and I've explained this to you before, when you've got nine or 10 plants, we're talking bricks on the East Coast, if we don't quite sell enough output, well, you know, what we do, First of all, you use maintenance. You know, a lot of them are run, you know, five, six, seven years. So you take them off and do some maintenance, and that takes ten percent off your production. But then, if I'm still in trouble, I've got too many, too much production. We've only got to take one of those plants offline on the whole east coast, and then we, we just shuffle it around to keep. So the, the remaining nine, you've got ten, take one off. The remaining nine still run at hundred percent capacity. So it's not really a such a concern. The same thing goes with our masonry plants. You know, we take one off. There's a network of ten or fifteen of them. You take one off and it brings all the others back to full capacity. And the same in the US? In the US, the same thing. I think you've seen it. Mark said we've come from 16 to 8. Um, you know, if we take another one off, we'll balance it up. Uh, you know, but we're still in the transition there. They had a lot of plants when we bought the business originally, a lot of plants running nine months of the year at 60% output. And bit by bit every year, we've run more plants through winter and, you know, and running them harder and longer. And so we're still, that process is still underway, almost complete, but still underway, so. And how are you experiencing the implications of 44% of your business being exposed to single family and what's going on in that market? Yeah, well, you don't think where the single family is. I mean, um, one of the big growth areas for us has been Texas, o Oklahoma, and Mark can talk more about this, but a lot of the people coming in there are coming out, of, they're leaving uh, California to get away from the taxes because they want to go to states where there's low taxes. They're not first home buyers. They're selling a home, they've got, they've had significant equity in, and they're buying homes. So they're not particularly worried about the, the cost of the mortgage rates. And remember, as I said, the mortgage rates as of this morning, were six, 30 year mortgage rate in the US is 6.6%, and it's been at about that level now for about five months. And with all the stuff that happened in the last 24 hours, that 30 year rate didn't move at all. So it's very stable. So that's why you're seeing people starting to return to that market. Self stabilized. So I don't think we're going to, at this point of time, I mean, I don't know what the future holds, but at this point of time, we don't anticipate a GFC style downturn. Sure. Thanks, Lindsay. Maybe down the front again. <laughs> Sorry? I was, we'll get to that in a second. Um, to, oh, th thanks. Um, with your agreement to supply 10 million bricks into the UK, uh, what's the current capacity in America? Um, can you easily meet that 10 million? We're bringing on, as Mark mentioned, we're bringing on the Rocky Ridge plant at about 35 million units. And it's also going to make a couple of specialist products for us. And we'll also be taking approximately about 10 million, 12 million out of Hanley and Pittsburgh. Yeah. And what about further expansion in years? Further, uh, further acquisitions, you mean? Yeah. No, I think for the time being, we're just happy to sit pat. <laughs> We've got enough on our plate. <laughs> Have we got any questions online, Mel? Yeah. A few questions online, thanks, Lindsay. Uh, first one from James Casey. With the capital expenditure for Horsley Park nearing completion, what are your capex requirements over the next two years? Yes, well, I, I think we've um, mentioned that, um, that that cost of that plant ran significantly over and it's also run significantly late. I'm very happy, though, that we've now built it. Um, to start that project today, it even cost you more money. Um, so we've got to commission those plants and so we're uh, throttling back our capex. So the capex will be at depreciation or less for the next few years um, while we just sort of um, 
digest what we've been doing in the last few. Next one from Liam Schofield. Can you please comment on the cap rate movement across the industrial JV and the manufacturing JV relative to revaluation gains, i.e. cap rates up, reval gain up? Yeah, I think what we were 35 points, Megan, we're up 35 points, but the rents exceeded that. And so that's why we ended up with a, with a revaluation profit of, remind me the number, um, don't. We had $114 million in revaluation profits, basically because that includes the development profit in that number or not, that's just, just the reval, reval. So put it this way, the, the, the growth in rents outpaced the growth in the cap rate expansion. And uh, just to make sort of that point just a bit clearer, when the valuer looks at it, he, they're looking at the transaction value of equipment buildings. They don't necessarily look at what your particular rent that you're receiving on that building they're looking at what that building would rent for if it was at market rent. So at the moment, as I mentioned before, we have 20 to, we're 20 to 25% under-rented on many of our properties. So, I mean, it depends what your view is, long-term view of interest rates, but if interest rates, you know, like no one can predict the future, but if interest rates as forecast peter out with another, another 25 or 50 points, well then, um, you know, the rent, rental growth has exceeded that uh, in that period. Next question. What sort of market share do you have in the brick market in America? What's the market's very low. Well, 7% nationally, <laughs> but in our key markets like New York, 70%, Philadelphia is 80%, Illinois is 80 million. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll have to repeat because I hear it online. Yeah, so nationally it's about 7%. But because we're focused in certain areas, the key markets in New York, it's like 70%. Chicago, it's 80%. Um, Philadelphia, it's similar sort of number. So in the areas we operate, we have exceptionally high market shares. But of course, we don't operate in the volume housing brick markets of Texas across to the Carolinas. Has the board discussed the merits of a buyback? The board discusses everything thoroughly, but buybacks are problematical. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Any more questions? I've got one down the front here, please. Maybe. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Anderson Chow from Jard, and um, just related to sort of capital management. Question: So our capex seems to sort of is about picking out is about to pick out property. We're seeing uh, very strong rental to come as we guide it for the next five years. Um, and you just mentioned your know, buyback probably a bit difficult. I'm um, sure we be expecting uh, ordinary dividend to you know it's a fantastic trade record of 47 years increase. But should we be expecting ordinary dividend to probably increasing a faster pace or maybe some sort of one-off special dividend something like that? Thanks. Generally, as a rule of thumb, we look at the dividends we received and the trust earnings to pay pay them out. And clearly, the trust earnings are going to grow. But we just got it. The next, there's a couple of things there. First of all, we don't know what's going to happen in the next you know 12 or 18 months. So we just got to be a bit cautious with what we do as far as the dividends concerned until we, we work our way through that. Um, but you know, there is the potential there to uh, continue increasing dividends. I'd be pretty certain about that. But to Dramatic increase or special, I'm not sure, not in the next sort of 12 or 18 months. Okay, one more from Mel. Why does the 6.31 deferred tax liability add to NTA per share? Page 10 of the slides. One figure grant. <laughs> I think what you're looking at there is the inferred uh, net asset, the inferred asset value, and what we've put in is a bridge between inferred asset value and NTA. So what we're saying is the inferred asset value, uh, there's deferred tax associated with uh, the property trust primarily um, that is not in that inferred asset um, bridge that we've done. So what we're doing is bridging from 
balance sheet NTA uh, back to the uh, inferred asset value that's bridged in that um, in that slide. So what we're trying to do is just reconcile the two. Makes sense. No more questions? Okay. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for coming on and listening to the Brickworks story. Thank you.